This is Dr. Tim Clinton for Family Talk. I want to thank you for joining us for our broadcast today. You may or may not know that Family Talk is a listener-supported program, and we remain on the air by your generosity. If you can help us at all financially, we would greatly appreciate it. Thank you also for your continued prayers and support of the ministry. Dr. Dobson's been fighting for the family for over 40 years now, and he's not about to stop, believe me. Here's Roger Marsh with more information on how you can support the ministry of Family Talk. And friend, thanks to generous listeners like you, Family Talk can reach more and more listeners with practical help and encouragement. To support Family Talk with your best gift, go online to drjamesdobson.org or call 877-732-6825. Today on Family Talk. Are you burned out as a parent? Are the needs of your children and upkeep of their schedules wearing you down? Is the approaching school year stressing you out already and it hasn't even begun yet? If you can identify with any of those observations and those feelings, listen closely to today's program. Welcome to Family Talk, a ministry produced by the James Dobson Family Institute. I'm Roger Marsh, and whether you are listening on the radio or online, we are so glad you've tuned in today. Today, we're going to revisit a classic interview Dr. Dobson did with psychologist and best-selling author John Rosemond. The two will identify ways that culture has warped parenting and neglected teaching kids obedience and respect. They'll also unpack the importance of proper discipline and boundaries in the home as well. If you're having trouble with a strong-willed child, then you will learn something from this interview. I guarantee it. So let's get to part one of Dr. James Dobson's conversation with John Rosemond here on Family Talk. We draw a lot of our information from the same source, you know, from the scripture and uh, from the Judeo-Christian system of values. And that's why we have been friends for many, many years, going back to the mid-1970s. And uh, he's been our guest here before. I'm speaking of psychologist and author John Rosemond. And he's written a number of best-selling books on parenting, including the one that we're going to talk about today, Parenting by the Book, Biblical Wisdom for Raising Your Child. He's obviously a deeply committed uh, Christian. He has his own uh, column that is carried in, uh, John, I think 200 newspapers around the country? You know, it's hard to tell from week to week, about 250, something Mm. like that. You've been doing that for a long time. I think all the way back to my days at Children's Hospital, I remember getting uh, reports of the, those uh, uh, commentaries, and <laughs> those you do a good job. Psychologically incorrect commentary. Yeah, <laughs> I've been writing a weekly column since March of 1976. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, I, I read someplace that you were in graduate school in the 60s. Is that correct? Late 60s, early All right. 70s. Yeah. So was I. Yeah. I finished my doctorate on April 3rd, 1967. So I'm probably ahead of you. I know I'm older than you About are. About five years, yeah. Uh, but w- I saw the same thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it took my breath away. I saw that uh, a whole new, quote new, a whole new concept of uh, children and authority and discipline, uh, all of that came into question. And what I had observed from largely from my mother, but from the culture and from the scripture, was now disrespected and disregarded. And it was that circumstance, as I went through graduate school, that caused me about the same time that I got out Mm -hmm. uh, to sit down and write Dare to Discipline. Uh, Because I was trying to say, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. And you were a voice crying in the wilderness. I was, and I took some flack for it, but that book is still out there. So uh, it must have had uh, some substance, and that substance was the scripture. And well, uh, that book, Jim, had a tremendous impact on me, too, because I'd come out of graduate school in the early 1970s completely indoctrinated in the new psychological point of view, which I call postmodern psychological parenting. And to encounter your book in the early 1970s and to read your book and just understand the common sense of it, uh, it was startling to me. It, um, mm-hmm. it was paradigm shifting for me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've told people for many, many years, and, you know, this is not a, a program mm-hmm. for mutual congratulations, <laughs> but, I mean, you've been a great role model in my career and my life, and yeah. I can't uh, express my appreciation enough. 
Well, when you're on the front lines, you enjoy having some fellow travelers out there, some other people who are willing to stand against the tide. What concerns me, John, is that uh, uh, the culture has forgotten those things. I mean, it's even more confused about them now than it was then. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe we made a little progress in... uh, uh, encouraging parents to implement those principles. But in the culture at large, uh, it's gone. I mean, I'm in the airport and I'm in markets and uh, all around uh, on travels and so on, and I just see parents with no clue as to how to gain control and build respect and build uh, a sense of worth in this generation of kids. Well, this is because primarily, I think, Jim, we shifted from a family structure that was parent-centered in the 1950s and before to a family structure that has been child-centered since the early 1970s. And children used to grow up in families where it was understood. The child's job was to pay attention to the parents. And now the implicit understanding and assumption is that it's good parenting to pay as much attention to and do as much for your child as you possibly can do. And one of the things that I tell people as I travel the country is that by age three, a child has intuited one of two conclusions concerning his relationship with his parents. Conclusion number one, the functional conclusion is, it is my job, speaking as the child, to pay attention to them my parents. Conclusion number two, it's their job, quite obviously, to pay attention to and do things for me. You and I are members of the last generation of American children who, by age three, understood it was our job to pay attention to them. That's what it's supposed to be. That's right. These Mm. are kids who are growing up in families who lack that understanding. Mm. And when you lack that fundamental understanding, Uh, you are going to be difficult to discipline. Uh, The title of your book, I've uh, indicated this is what we're going to be talking about, is Parenting by the Book, Biblical Wisdom for Raising Your Child. Uh, You may have been referring here to parenting by this book or your book, but I don't think so. I think you were saying uh, parenting by the book book, The Word of God, which has a lot to say about children. Well, that's why I told my publisher to capitalize the letter T in the word the. They they came back to me and they said, why do you want... I said, it's the book I'm talking about. This is the Bible. This is a source of eternal truth. God has set forth a plan in the Bible concerning how we should raise children. We're not following that plan in America. That's the root cause of our problems. That's what I'm talking about. Isn't it amazing how it works? Isn't it amazing how effective that word is when you apply it to children? Absolutely. I mean, it just uh, is phenomenal to see those principles in effect. And, uh, and see the consequences for children. Yeah, you know, Jim, this is not self-promotion, but I do 200 talks a year all over America, and people will come up to me and tell me, you know, John, I came and I expected to talk on how I should deal with tantrums and how I should deal with uh, resistance on the part of my child and rebellion and talking back and so on and so forth. And instead, what people hear from me is a description of a point of view that you should carry into the raising of a child. And I'm absolutely convinced if you carry the right point of view into the raising of a child, and the only right point of view is described in Scripture, you will do the right thing most of the time. All right, what is that point of view and what's the source for it? The point of view that's set forth in Scripture is that discipline is the act of discipling the child. It is the act of turning the little tyrant, the toddler, I sometimes call him a little criminal, into a pro-social human being who will look up to you, follow your lead, and subscribe to your values. And I can't emphasize enough to parents in America, you don't do this with behavior modification. Mm. You do it through role modeling and instruction and leadership. And this is what parenting is all about. And these people come up to me and they say, John, you know, I, I got it. You know, I left here with a different point of view and it's made all the difference in my family. And it's not my point of view. It's, uh, I'm a messenger. You know that, Jim. Where do you find it in Scripture? 
You find it everywhere in Scripture. You find it even in places where it doesn't refer specifically to children. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 is a good example. There's a time for everything and a season to every purpose or activity, mm-hmm. depending on translation, under heaven. Now, how many people would read that and think that it applies to kids? But it does. It says there's a time for everything. There's a season to every purpose, which means... There are seasons to the raising of children. And one of the things I do in Parenting by the Book is talk about those seasons and what your purpose as a parent should be in each one of those seasons. Mm. Uh, It is uh, a pleasure to raise children who have been trained according to these principles. And and yet you see kids uh, disrespecting the authority of their parents. You see parents who feel like they're going to damage the children somehow Mm -hmm. by leading them, by saying, uh, let's get something straight here. I'm the parent. You're the child. You will do what I tell you to do because Mm -hmm. this is in your best interest and this is what God tells me to do. Mm -hmm. So expect it. If you challenge me and you disobey me, uh, I will give you reason to regret it. I mean, we can sit and talk, but there comes a time when you're going to do what I want you to do because I love you, little one, and I will not do anything to hurt you. I'm trying to get you ready uh, to be an effective adult. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of versions of that, but I bet sure. you've given that speech before. Well, you know, I, the way the variation that I used to deliver it to my children in was this. You make your decisions, kids— and then I will make mine. Mm -hmm. And the understanding was, you make a good decision and I will stay out of your life. You make a bad decision and I'm gonna be in your life in a way you don't like it. You know, and I used to tell my kids, look, if you want to keep your big daddy off your back, all you got to do is do the right thing. John, it's that you're simple. you're threatening these little kids. You are <laughs> oppressive to these children. I, I, you are overbearing. You are taking away their freedom, their individuality. You're warping these kids. Have you ever been charged oh, with Oh, absolutely. I, I won't mention names, but uh, a parenting quote expert end quote uh, once in a forum accused me of being hung up on punishment and you know jim as well as i do that all of the research says the happiest kids are the most obedient and vice versa Mm -hmm. and i say to parents if you want to grow a happy child a child who is comfortable in his or her own skin make sure your child is obedient and the bible tells you how to do that You are listening to an insightful conversation Dr. James Dobson had with psychologist and author John Roseman here on Family Talk, a radio ministry of the James Dobson Family Institute. We thank you for your consistent support of Dr. Dobson over the years, and especially right now. Your generosity fuels us to continue fighting for marriages and families worldwide. Visit drjamesdobson.org to learn how to make a donation to support our ministry today. That's drjamesdobson.org. And now let's return to Dr. Dobson's conversation with John Roseman. We've titled it God's Wisdom for Raising Children here on Family Talk. Uh, John, have you ever read the statement about child rearing that was written by the mother of John and Charles Wesley, the uh, noted uh, evangelist from the 1700s? Uh, She had some pretty dramatic things to say about raising children. Have you ever read what she wrote? I have never, but I have have been referred to a biography, and I'm I'm about to expose myself to their lives and— Looking forward to it. Well, I have a a short piece uh, that uh, came from a longer statement that she made, but it's written in the language of the 18th century, and uh, it's a little difficult to uh, understand today, but it's right on target. And uh, Susanna Wesley obviously uh, learned some things from raising 17 kids, and I have uh, drawn some of my own perspectives from uh, her longer statement, which I won't take the time to read. But let me just uh, uh, share a paragraph or two from what she had to say. She wrote, in order to form the minds of children, the first thing to be done is to conquer the will and to bring them into an obedient temper. 
To inform the understanding is a work of time and must with children proceed by slow degrees as they are able to bear it. But the subjecting of the will is a thing which must be done at once, and the sooner the better. For by neglecting timely correction, they will contract a stubbornness and an obstinacy which is hardly ever conquered, and never without using such severity as would be painful to me as to the children. In the esteem of the world, those who withhold timely correction would pass for kind and indulgent parents, whom I call cruel parents, who permit their children to get habits which they know must afterward be broken. Uh, she goes on from there, and you can hear the wisdom of this godly mother in what she's writing. And see, uh, I have in my book, Strong Will Child, and numerous other places, talked about shaping the will without breaking the spirit. And she's talking here about shaping the will. Uh, John, did you agree with what she said? You know, you mentioned that she raised 17 children. These women who raised uh, mm -hmm. 10, 12, 17 kids prior to the psychological parenting revolution that we're talking about, yeah. they brought to the raising of children a calm yet forceful authority. One of the things that I tell my audiences is I'm a member of the last generation of American children who were blessed to be afraid of their mothers. <laughs> and, you know, people will yeah. look at me, these young people, and I say, look, this was a biblical fear. It was a biblical fear. In the Bible, it says, fear of the Lord is of benefit to us. Mm -hmm. It's not of benefit to him. It's not for his benefit that we fear him. And the same is true in the parent-child relationship. A child who is biblically afraid of his parents, who is intimidated by their calm, purposeful authority is a child who is truly blessed. You know, I write often about my father, and uh, I had a great relationship with him. And uh, the truth of the matter is, my mother in the early days was the far greater influence. And uh, I suppose I don't talk as much about her because it's not as socially acceptable for a man to talk about his mommy as it is to talk about his his daddy, I suppose. But my mother really understood discipline. And I was afraid of her, but I also knew she would not harm a hair on my head. She loved me enough to die for me, mm -hmm. and she made me know it. She cared about what I thought. She cared about what I felt. And in so many ways, she um, built uh, a confidence within me uh, that allowed me to compete in life as a man. But I would not take her on. And the few times that I did it, I lived to regret it. Uh, I, I sassed her. I really, I don't know, I was about seven, eight years of age. And I just said something really disrespectful. I don't remember what it was, but I do remember what she did about it. I, I remember taking a step back and thinking, I, I probably shouldn't have said that. <laughs> and she reached out to see what she could get a hold of to whack me with, and her hand landed on a girdle. When I spoke in Gastonia, North Carolina, I probably told that story because I can still hear that thing coming. And, you know, she, those are the days when a girdle weighed about 16 pounds, oh, you sure. know, and it had yeah. straps all over it. And uh, it came flying through the air, and she caught me across the chest. And I, and then all those straps came around after. And I got a whole spanking with one blow. But you know what? I didn't do that again. That's I didn't great, do that again. What a great story. But I lived in safety because that never happened unless I had asked for it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It wasn't an arbitrary act on your mother's part. <laughs> it was She odd. had not lost control, no, not by any means. No, she just wasn't going to take it. Yeah. Now, you do believe in corporal punishment. I have no problem with it at all, per se. You know, I think that you can overdo it. I think that you can do it in a way that is irresponsible. But I have absolutely no problem with it whatsoever at, at a per se level. You know, people think that old-fashioned parenting of the type that you and I experienced as kids 
was just replete with spankings, that we just got a spanking every other day or yeah. something. There was a poll done about 10 years ago, Jim, and I can't put the finger on the specifics of it, but it was a poll of people our age, thereabouts. One of the questions asked was, how many times do you estimate that you were spanked in your entire childhood? Surprisingly to most people, especially people who came after us, the average answer was five. And that's how many times I think I was spanked as a child, was five times. The spanking was not the centerpiece of discipline. Right. Leadership was the centerpiece of discipline. And, you know, one of the interesting things that I do, Jim, in my audiences is I ask how many people were raised by a mother who never yelled. And an audience of 500 people, maybe 300 people will raise their hands. And then I say, is there a woman in this audience tonight with children living with her in the home who can say that she has never yelled at her children? And do you know there are times when in 500, a 500-person 500 audience, I'll get no hands up? Is that right? And my point, I will say, this is what postmodern psychological parenting has caused. It has caused parenting to be a tremendously stressful affair Mm. because we are trying to parent according to a set of rules that don't work Mm. and that have nothing in common whatsoever with the directions that God has clearly given us in his word. John, that is so good, and I believe it's absolutely true. Uh, There is great concern today about child abuse, and I'm one of the people who are concerned about it. It's Mm -hmm. happening all over the country. And uh, and sometimes I get accused of uh, encouraging a parental behavior that would lead to child abuse. The truth is it's the exact opposite. You tie the hands of parents. You leave them only negotiation as a way to get the child to do what the parent wants them to do. And and you tell them that uh, any overt uh, uh, physical punishment or any kind of punishment, whether it's sitting on a chair or going to the room or whatever it is, uh, when you put them in a straitjacket where what they do is going to fail, it leads to overreaction. It Absolutely. leads to yelling. Yes. It leads to child abuse. Yes, it does. It actually it leads, is related to fun, right. uh, child abuse. It leads to these huge explosions that take place. And this is one of the consequences of this new parenting, is the buildup, the constant buildup of stress, and then the explosion on the part of the parent. And, um, you know... The studies, Jim, and uh, you know this as well as I do, but I'll just bring it out for the benefit of our listeners. The studies have clearly indicated that children who score highest on measures of emotional and social well-being are children whose parents occasionally spank. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. yeah. And there have been a thousand studies that uh, have been faulty, in my view, showing that spanking leads to all kinds of emotional damage. Uh, What they don't explain is that nearly every one of those studies is uh, based on parents who are abusing Mm -hmm. their kids Mm -hmm. and not separating that from those who use it judiciously as a way of reinforcing authority Mm -hmm. and then saturating the relationship with love. That's a totally different thing. Completely different thing. And those studies that you refer to, I... I wrote a book called To Spank or Not to Spank, and I I researched a lot of those studies. And uh, Jim, again, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. These are researchers with an agenda. And you Mm -hmm. cannot do honest research if you begin your research with an agenda, with the attempt to prove something. Mm -hmm. The only legitimate research is done by people who aren't attempting to prove anything. They're Mm -hmm. attempting to investigate. John, isn't it interesting that uh, I was on... Uh, the West Coast, you were on the East Coast. We had gone through secular training institutions, and uh, we met as adults, and we have drawn the same conclusions based on the Scripture and based on our own observations. And they're valid, and they work, and you have put them, uh, many of them, in this book, Parenting by the Book, Parenting by the Word of God. And uh, it's uh, been a pleasure working with you through these years. Let's do another program tomorrow, shall we? 
Let's do. All right. We'll do it. Thanks for being our guest today. Jim, I've thoroughly enjoyed it as usual. Thank you for having me on. We hope you've enjoyed listening to psychologist and author John Roseman here on Family Talk. You can visit our broadcast page at drjamesdobson.org to find a link to John's ministry. You'll also learn more about his various books and the articles that he's written for his website as well. You can find all that and much, much more by visiting drjamesdobson.org and then clicking onto the broadcast page. We encourage you to listen to Family Talk and Dr. Dobson using Amazon's Alexa. If you have this smart device, you simply use a command to access our daily broadcasts. So go to drjamesdobson.org forward slash Alexa to learn how to activate your Amazon Alexa. Remember to come back again tomorrow to hear the conclusion of Dr. Dobson's conversation with John Roseman right here on Family Talk, a ministry of the James Dobson Family Institute. I'm Roger Marsh. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day.